you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. And it's totally true. And the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard. And you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you got to love it, you got to have passion. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this, uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it change it improve it make your mark upon it um, I, I think that's very important and however you learn that once you learn it uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways um, once you learn that you'll never be the same again It's very interesting. I was worth um, about over a million dollars when I was 23, and over 10 million dollars when I was 24, and over 100 million dollars when I was 25. Um, and it's, it wasn't that important uh, because I never did it for the money. Uh, I. I think money is a wonderful thing because it enables you to do things. It enables you to in invest in ideas that don't have a short-term payback and things like that. But especially at that point in my life, it was, it was not the most important thing. The most important thing was the company, the people, the products we were making, what we were going to enable people to do with these products. So uh, I didn't think about it a great deal. You know, I never sold any stock and just really believed that the company would would do very well over the long term. Now is the time to take risk. You don't have kids. As you get older, your obligations increase. So you, the, and once you have a family, you start taking risk not just for yourself, but for your family as well. It gets much harder to uh, do things that might not work out. Um, so now is the time t to do that. Uh, before you, before you have those obligations. So I would, I would encourage you to take risks now, do something bold. Um, you won't regret it. Really liking what you do, what, whatever area that you get into, um, given that you know, even if you're, if you're the best the best, there's always a chance of failure. So I think it's important that you really like whatever you're doing. Um, if, if you don't like it, life is too short. If you like what you're doing, you think about it even when you're not working. I mean, you, it'll just, it, it's, it's something that your mind is drawn to. Um, and, and if you don't like it, you, you just really can't make it work, I think. You focus on, on signal over noise. Um, a lot of companies get, get confused. They, they spend money on things that don't actually make the product better. For example, at, at Tesla, 
we've, we've never spent any money on advertising. Um, we, we put all of the money into R&D and, and manufacturing and design to try to make the car as good as possible. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that, that's the way to go. For, for any given company, just can, can keep thinking about are these efforts that p people are, are expending, are they resulting in a better product or service? And if they're not, stop those efforts. You know, personally, I think every time is a perfect time to start a business. There's no bad times. If, if you do the work, if you do the preparation, you'll know when it's time. And it doesn't mean that it won't be a little bit scary, but, you know, it, it's, you'll know. And you don't have to quit the daytime job if you, if you don't feel all that comfortable, and you can give it a run at night. Um, but whatever works for you now with the Internet, um, you've got all the choices in the world. And you can just go out there and do your own thing. And, and you know, set up a business part-time. Passion I've always had for business and being an entrepreneur that, tra that transfers into the Mavs, I I've always been passionate. Some people thought, you know, it's, a, it's more OCD than anything else, which I think is a, a great trait for an entrepreneur. Um, when I, you know, I mentioned the stamp business, I would stay up till 3, 4 in the morning, even though I had to get up and go to school, and read Lynn Stamp News and Scott Stamp Journals and have them all memorized and, and use that to give myself an edge. Um, even when I was in college, um, I'd be in, in the library reading business books and just looking for business biographies and just reading all I could about business. Um, when I had micro solutions and, you know, I started with no money, you know, I, I'd pull all-nighters in, in front of borrowed computers teaching myself software and, and how to program. They come up with an idea, they'll Google it, and if they don't see it in the first two pages, they think it's original. You've got to go back, right? Because over the past 15 years, there's so many different businesses that have tried and failed. You have to go back and find those and learn from those. So you've got to understand all the implications and you have to learn from history. And so the best advice I can give you on a video before talking to you or emailing with you is that you've got to find out the history of people who have tried your idea because there's a 99.99999% chance that your idea has been tried before. That's not a good reason not to start it because you might be able to outperform them, but you better learn from the history of your idea um, because you know what they say about people who don't learn from history. The most important thing about uh, running a company uh, is to remember all the time what a company is. Um, a company is simply a group of people um, and uh, as a leader of people uh, you have to be a great listener, um, you have to be a great motivator, uh, you have to uh, be very good at praising and looking for the best in people. Um, you know, people are no different from, from flowers. If you water flowers, they flourish. If you um, praise people, they flourish. And, um, and that's a critical attribute of, um, of a leader. Uh, I've never actually thought I was um, you know, starting a company as such. Um, I just saw uh, situations as I uh, traveled in life um, where I felt I could improve on the way things were being done by other people. So, um, you know, so uh, would, you know, one of my favorite phrases is screw it, let's do it. And, <laughs> and I've, I've used that phrase a lot of times. And, we've, and, um, and we've, you know, we just love going in and trying to shake up industries and doing it better than it's been done before. The New York Times did a review and they, and they did some market research and they said, you know, first of all, with a name like Virgin, it's, it's not going to go the whole way. Um, but, um, uh, but, but, sec <laughs> but secondly, that um, uh, they did market research which said only 7% of people would um, fly on an airline called Virgin. And, and we put our hands up and said 7% would be just fine. So, uh, <laughs> and, and so we, we carried on with it. But there were, a lot of, there were a lot of skeptics out there. And there always will be lots of skeptics when you, when you want to start something new. Everybody will tell you, why it's a bad idea, why you shouldn't do it, 
uh, why you'll you know lose everything you've got and in the end you just got to get out and try to prove them wrong but good luck when i uh in the graduate from universities and before i you know for three years i tried to fill in the universities so i applied jobs for 30 times got rejected i went for a police they said no you're not good I went to even the uh, KFC. When KFC came to China, come to my city, <laughs> you 20, 24 people went for the job. 23 people were accepted. I was the only one guy. <laughs> and we went for police. Five people, four of them accepted. I was the only guy that I received, received it. So to me, being turned down, rejected. Oh, by the way, I told you that I, would, I applied for Harvard for 10 times rejected. We believe the co company different from the Wall Street. We believe customer number one, employee number two, shareholder number three. Customer one, employee two, two shareholder, shareholder number three. three. Yeah, are we, again, this is my religion. And you know, if you, it's the customer that pay us the money. It's the employees that drive the innovation. It's the shareholder, and the shareholder always say, you know, I, I remember the day before we IPO, and a lot of people say, Jack, can I give up the shares? We were long term shareholders. But when the crisis came, these guys, wrong as soon as you know, they, they ran away they ran away <laughs> my people stayed custom stayed when most people complain where the opportunity is people start complaining some people complain some start people start to change themselves change the others You know, people really, if you really think about it, people want to do business with people they like. I mean, every now and then you'll do a deal with the devil, but you don't really like the devil, but you have to do it sometimes. But you'd really much rather do business with somebody you like, somebody who shares your value, somebody who you know is committed to the same objectives you are, somebody who's willing to work as hard as, as you are. And when you find those people, those are the people you want to bring under your tent to be part of your, your business objective. And you've got to do that by, you know, sort of presenting yourself in a way that people clearly understand that you are committed to creating value. Business people want to create value. It doesn't mean they don't want to have fun, doesn't mean that they don't uh, want to be uh, involved in other kinds of things. But if, if you can say, go to someone and convince them that I can help you create value. And by your ability to articulate that and to communicate it and to give people the impression that you will work as hard as they will to create that value, you're going to find people wanting to come to you. Yeah. If, if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe that you can overcome obstacles, if you don't believe you have the work ethic, if you don't believe you have the inner confidence to project to other people, it'll never happen. Because part of starting a business is not, having, not only having the vision of an idea, you've got to build around you a team of stakeholders who believe in you. People follow leaders. People invest in leaders. People support people who have a vision and are willing to and are able to articulate it and not just the ability to, you know a lot of people are good I got a good gift for gab it's the ability to convince people that you're going to be part of something that's going to be successful you're going to share in the success it's going to be beneficial to you and your family in the long run you're going to be respected for what you contribute and you're going to have an opportunity to fulfill your own dreams consistent with the dreams of the person you're working with. If you can convey that sense of confidence and that, consent, that sense of leadership and focus on giving people an opportunity to grow and be successful with you, you're going to have people, and I mean really smart people, coming to be a part of what you do. Imagine a group of people go to a restaurant and they start eating. Well, they don't have enough money to pay the bill. So when the waiter comes with the bill, they, they don't want to pay it. They don't want to make the sacrifice of paying. So they keep ordering. And that's what we're doing. We just keep piling on debt and keep piling on costs 
because we don't want to make the hard choices. You find your passion. I was very, very lucky to find it, you know, when I was uh, seven or eight years old. And, you know, and, and fortunately, my children have found their passion. My, you know, one son loves farming like nothing else. One son loves music like everything else. And, and all three of them love philanthropy and what they get to do. You're lucky in life when you, you find it. And uh, you can't guarantee you're going to find it in your first job out. But I always tell college students that come out, I say, take the job that you would take if you were independently wealthy. You know, that's, you're going to do well at it. If you think you're going to be a lot happier if you've got 2x instead of x, you're probably making a mistake. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, you, ought to, you, ought to, you ought to find something you like that's, that works with that. And, if, and you'll get in trouble if, if you think that making 10x or 20x is the answer to everything in life. Because then you will do things like borrow money when you shouldn't or, or maybe cut corners on, on things that your employer wants you to cut corners on. Or it just doesn't make any sense. You won't like it when you look back on it. It never bothered me if people disagreed with what I thought, uh, as long as I felt I knew the facts. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of things I don't know a thing about. I just stay away from those. Uh, so I stay within what I call my circle of competence. You know, that uh, Tom Watson said it best. He said, you know, he said, he said, I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots. Well, I try and stay around those spots, and I, I just don't have a, a problem if. if uh, if somebody says, you know, you're wrong on something, I, just, I go back and look at the facts and, and, and I, think that, I think that really is much more important, frankly, than, than having a few points of IQ or, or having an extra course or two in, in school or anything of the sort. You need emotional stability. Even today, as big as Nike is with over 60,000 employees, the key, key thing is people. And so when you're starting out, obviously, getting the right people, is, that's life and death. And, and then, not only the right people, but getting them to work together and, and work for a common purpose. I've always said two nines working together will beat two tens working apart any day. And how do you do that? Well, and pick the right people is for number one, and then uh, giving them the environment and, uh, and maybe a little bit of leadership that allows them to keep doing that. important thing is you have to, there's two sides, it's really sort of the intellectual or mental side. You have to pick a business that has a niche. You have to have a reason to succeed. You have to be something like we were doing, say, Japan can beat Germany in manufacturing of this type of a product. That was the niche, really. And then on that, you just have to have a total and complete passion because there's going to be so many dark moments. Uh, you know, I think it, the dark moments are true for any uh, entrepreneur or any uh, startup company. I'm sure that you talk to Steve Jobs and Apple, you'd see uh, many, many dark, dark moments. Ours happen to last a little longer than most of them, but you really emotionally have to be prepared for those dark moments. Mm. Having my travels, occasionally met promising young people who insist they are not going to ask for help along the way. They want to figure it out themselves. Mine was the opposite approach. It is hard enough out there. Get all the help you can. Getting help really is just a part of a lifelong search for wisdom. One of the things I, I see in uh, new businesses is they're often looking for perfection. And I think this is a really big mistake. I think, I think you ought to be uh, looking for experiments and, and you know, quick experiments. And it's okay to have little failures. Uh, and what you want to do is learn as much as you can very quickly and try things. And uh, you know, certainly when we were a small business, you know, we'd go out and try all sorts of things to find what would work. And then you know, we found something that worked. Well, we'll do that a hundred more times or a thousand more times. We still to do it today as a large company. One of the things that uh, people do instinctually when there are tough times is they kind of do nothing. 
and, and, and uh, you know they they don't they don't uh, they kind of hunker down. Is this is sort of frozen rabbits yeah, in the headlights. Yeah, thing. The, you know it's kind of just just uh, complete stunned into inaction, and I think that's actually the worst thing to do. I think times when everyone is confused and kind of stunned present you know the most enormous opportunity uh, because nobody's really doing anything. So. You know, I think this is a time where uh, the, the seeds of really successful new businesses will be created. In fact, if you look in our industry, which I'm most familiar with, you know, uh, the greatest companies kind of came out of and were formed in some of the most difficult times in the industry. When no one was really looking and everyone thought the whole thing was going to go south, all of a sudden a whole new breed of companies, uh, you know, emerged. So, for example, if you look at, at uh, you know, the, when Dell was formed in the early 1980s, 1984, this was a pretty dark time in the U.S. economy. The personal computer industry had just gone through a big down cycle, and the prevailing wisdom was that all electronics would be dominated by the Japanese. Yeah. You know, and, and that we had this big boogeyman called the, the you know, Japan Inc., and that no one could compete with Japan Inc. And in, in, especially in something like computers. Well, that turned out to be completely wrong, and there you know, was enormous opportunity, and huge waves of productivity were unleashed with the computer industry you know, flourishing. If you really don't know, you know what, what what it means to be an entrepreneur, you know maybe you aren't one. You know, so so I, I think there's a, a bit of kind of self initiative uh, and self starter, you know that that is incredibly important part of, of entrepreneurship. I mean, no one can sort of tell you how to do it. You have to sort of have an instinctual uh, you know feeling or an idea about about something, and you got to be passionate about it. I mean, I think people that look for great ideas to make money uh, you know, aren't nearly as, as successful as those who say, okay, what do I really love to do? What am I excited about? What do I know something about?